so we are fortunate to be joined by Caroline Gannett for as our next presenter. And um, she'll be speaking on the topic of how to evaluate our own haiku. Um, this presentation will explore approaches to evaluating your own haiku, a few key concepts underpinning English language haiku, such as the images, the use of space, different techniques, subject matter, and aesthetic principles will be explored in relation to reading, writing, and thinking about haiku and emphasis will be placed on the personal journey, voice, and authenticity. And um, Caroline will finish with a Q&A session, so you can do as you did uh, previously, either unmute yourselves or uh, type some questions into the chat. So a little bit about Caroline first. Um, Caroline is the editor of Hedgerow and Blythe Spirit, which is the Journal of the British Haiku Society. Born in Stockholm, Sweden, she now lives with her family by the River Medway in up north UK. And I will just pop her website into the chat so you could uh, check out some of her work there. Um, that's it from me. Over to you, Caroline, when you're ready. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And if I could just start by saying how much I enjoyed the Crystal's uh, presentation. I thought it was it was so beautiful and I've already tried to be on PayPal to get the book but I forgot my password so it's gonna to have to be later um, also thank you to Jay for inviting me and to everyone involved in organizing and um, the conference and to my lovely moderator Antoinette thank you for introducing me um, I will start now I'll try and share my um, my screen um, Let's see what I can do. And then I will stop the video for now and come back in a little bit. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. So the one question that I hear hiker writers mention over and over again, and it's also one that I ask myself, is how do we evaluate our own haiku? Um, the ideas I will present and further explore have grown out on my own writing, reading, editing, and mentoring. I've singled out a few aspects that in my experience can make subtle or at times even dramatic changes to our writing, rewriting, as well as thinking about haiku. Not every aspect will resonate with every writer, so please bear this in mind and take away only what's right for you. And I, I'd like to further invite you to think about what aspects you would include um, or you are including when you're evaluating your own work and perhaps you could share them later. So here, here is a, a short glimpse of what will happen. Um, but why evaluate our own hike in the first place? Um, would we, should we not leave that to others? Well, developing these skills can deepen our appreciation of haiku and help us develop both as writers and readers. To be able to assess our own work can encourage self-awareness and it can help identify both strengths and possible areas of improvement and could assist us in the process of writing, revising, and publishing haiku, in particular, the last two steps. The process of evaluating our own poems can help us ask questions about our own writing and might reveal something about our vision, whatever it may look like. Um, I use this term rather loosely here, so feel, feel free to find a word that suits you, perhaps intention or purpose. But let's start by asking ourselves or <laughs> yourselves, um, why do I write? And in particular, why haiku? And I'd like to invite you to keep the above question in your mind throughout this presentation, hoping that you'll share something about this perhaps at the end. Um, I am to leave around 15 minutes for Q&A, and so I look forward to hearing your thoughts then. Let's start by going back to the basics, the images. Looking closer at the images is key in developing our haiku, as this is where the haiku happens. But just what do we mean by the images in haiku? 
To recap, a concrete image is grounded in the senses, i.e. they are specific images conveying specific sensory information. They can help anchor upon in the present moment. An abstract image, on the other hand, describe qualities that are less tangible, more conceptual, and offer multiple interpretations. So just how do we use these images to express a moment, experience, and to evoke feeling? Since haiku are rooted in the senses, typically incorporating at least one concrete image, this puts emphasis on perception, um, the process by which the brain makes sense uh, or processes the sensory input by mixing memory, emotion, and cognition into the experience. <laughs> and so it makes sense to fine tune this quality through developing a closer awareness of the five basic senses and other perhaps less known senses to do with balance and spatial awareness, like proprioception. Um, using different senses in haiku, or even multiple senses in the same haiku, could impact the reader's experience of the poem. As we tend to respond differently to different senses, um, this could be used effectively in haiku. By swimming in on each sense in haiku, we can perhaps go deeper into the sensations and add depth and meaning. It also offers a way back to re-experience the moment in the revision stage. Um, for instance, if a haiku feels flat or it's missing something, connecting and reconnecting sensitively and deeply with our senses can help us notice and become aware of those small details we may otherwise have missed or that will indeed make our haiku come alive for the reader. So as I do a quick roundup of the senses, feel free to grab a pen and paper and check in with your own senses in real time and notice what's there. <clears throat> for myself, I can certainly um, feel my heartbeat, possibly even um, hear it. But jokes aside, to make this a regular thing to check in with your senses, and uh, maybe even part of your writing practice could help fine tune our perception and in turn our haiku. For instance, touch, um, thought to be the first sense we develop, is uh, developed, is linked not just to how we interact with the world, but to our very well being. For example, it can convey compassion, it can help us feel more connected, grounded, present. This highlights not just the relationship between the senses and our feelings, but how this can be utilized in our haiku to convey a certain feeling, mood, or emotional response. Sight is important in descriptive writing, and haiku often rely on this sense, but perhaps we could ask ourselves how using different senses, or even multiple senses, as mentioned, in our haiku could lead to a fuller or more immersive reader experience. Apparently, some qualities of our voice uh, doesn't sound the same to us as someone standing next to us. Sound is processed differently coming from inside or outside. It reaches the eardrum from a different route. I'm mentioning this as it reminds me of haiku and how the reader responds differently to a haiku than we might ourselves. Music is a good example when thinking about how sound can affect our emotional state. Smell is interesting too, in the way this sense it often triggers memories. Again, this is something that can be used in a haiku. And of course, there's an intricate relationship between taste and smell. How we experience taste, what we are drawn to, is apparently partly due to our genetic makeup as well as experience. We are all unique in life as in haiku. <laughs> So let's have a look at two examples here that use multiple senses to various effects. The first one, Darkness Inside the Guitar, Summer Thunder, by Tyler McIntosh. It was published in Hedgerow. Um, darkness in that first line effectively enhances the sound of Summer Thunder in line three. It is almost as if thunder is coming from inside the guitar. Crematorium, the sound of someone unwrapping flowers. Francis Angela, published in Acorn. Here sound invites us both to picture the flowers being unwrapped as well as possibly imagine the smell. Both poems evoke feeling without obviously stating it. 
And there's so much more to discuss about these, both these haiku and also the other examples I will use throughout this talk. Um, but I must limit my commentary to fit it all in. Uh, but I hope that you will return to these poems to explore their uh, deeper levels and connections, perhaps at the later stage. So having explored concrete imagery in greater detail through the senses, let's see what happens if we add an abstract image or part to our haiku. How does this change the mood, feeling, emotion? When and how can it be effective? Abstract images tend to be based perhaps in ideas, concepts, emotions. They have many interpretations, and this is perhaps how they can be, um, they can add interest to haiku by inviting the reader inside the poet's mind. Um, but it has to be done delicately. Um, uh, you will need to make sure that the abstract image or detail actually serves the poem by somehow adding interest or expanding the poem. Different poets will achieve this in different ways. Some writers use abstraction without being aware of it. Um, to be deliberate tends to produce more impactful results. Uh, to show what I mean, I have found two examples of haiku to handle abstraction in different ways and to quite different effect. Night sky, one of those stars might be the reset button by Susan and Tolin um, from her book, The Years That Went Missing. Um, and I believe that was actually published by the Backpoint Press. It, it actually is a brilliant press. Um, the first line here anchors the poem in the present moment, yet the two final words in line two might be as a reflective mood to the haiku, effectively turning the concrete image of reset button into an abstract one. Just Please How to Forgive Spring Rain by Michelle Tennyson from her book, Memoration. Um, it's a Red Moon publication. The contrast created here between the abstract and the concrete, as well as the multiple readings that this hike invites, both structurally, um, depending on where you place the cut or cuts, and emotionally, uh, lend this poem deeper layers and meanings. Each reader will find slightly different connections when exploring the relationship between images, whether they are strictly concrete or indeed making use of abstraction. Further, and this is a point I want to emphasize, as this is one I keep returning to when mentoring Heike poets and when assessing my own work, the distance between images determines how well the reader connects the dots. Too close and the poem seems to be too obvious, too far apart, and we may lose the reader altogether. Hence, we're constantly looking for just the right distance to serve each haiku. This leads us on to discussions of clarity as opposed to ambiguity. How much clarity is needed for a haiku to be effective? Well, there is no right or right answer, answer to this question. It is nevertheless a question to bear in mind when we revise our haiku. Um, so let me bring this into a different scenario. I like to take photographs, especially macro and especially of nature. However, when you set your camera for your particular shot, you'll need to have an idea of what you wish to achieve or what we may refer to again as a vision. Perhaps in hike, this is more intuitive. Um, but returning to the camera, there are so many decisions to make um, if we don't shoot in auto mode. But if we set up a camera manually, we have more control of the resulting images rather than letting the camera make these decisions for us. Um, we have to think about composition, angles, but also aperture, shutter speed, and so forth. Or to put in uh, put in the questions relevant to macro, uh, to macro photography in particular, how much do I blur at the background? How much of the subject do I keep in focus and why? So for a wildlife fighter, for instance, I would probably prefer to see the plant or insect in its habitat. But for artistic or other aesthetic effect, I might want to play around with blur and negative space. Um, with experience, this, um, <clears throat> this whole process becomes probably more intuitive. Um, in a way, we may experience something similar in haiku and could possibly use this way of thinking about our own haiku. 
But in contrast to photography, we don't have to make these decisions before writing a haiku. We can do so in the editing stage. Even if you're a haiku poet who does not really edit your poems, um, to be guided by a vision, um, perhaps more intuitively, can still be helpful whenever we sit down to think a bit deeper about what we're trying to express and convey. So asking questions about our intentions for writing and sharing haiku may in turn lead to improving in evaluating our own work and the effect it may have once shared. Um, now let's look a bit closer at techniques, poetic devices and writing outside our comfort zone or comfort zones, because we might have a few. Um, so what is meant by writing outside our comfort zone or zones? And indeed, what can be gained from doing so? Um, I think this definition by Oxford Dictionary answers these questions quite well. A situation where one feels safe or at ease, a settled method of working that requires little effort and yields only barely acceptable results. Example sentence, if you stay within your comfort zone, you will never improve. Um, I'm laughing a bit because it is a bit harsh, um, but conveniently the example sentence underscores the point I'm trying to make. Um, I'm not saying that we should change something for the sake of change itself, but rather I think it's crucial for any artist to ask ourselves if we are digging deep enough, because in doing so, we might indeed find areas with room for improvement. Um, but how is it done? Or should I say, um, how could it be done? Um, I guess it starts by establishing what our comfort zones are. Perhaps we um, rely over rely on certain techniques, themes, structures, formats, phrases, poetic devices, words. Um, well, I know I do. And so what it entails to write outside our comfort zones will vary from writer to writer. And this is how we can learn from each other by close reading, discussing and listening. It goes back to asking questions about our own writing and that of others and about haiku in general. It's about staying curious and keeping an open mind as much as it is about knowing our particular tastes and how to let them guide us. I think it's also about being honest, especially with ourselves perhaps, and speak our own truths. Um, I know it all sounds um, simple enough, but is it? Um, I will not go into detail about the various techniques, as this has been done by others already and elsewhere. Rather, I want to draw your attention to the plurality of these and how this can be a helpful tool, both in writing and evaluating our haiku. Also, trying out or exploring different and new techniques, perhaps even develop our own, provides a way of writing outside our comfort zones. In other words, trying something new can further our understanding of the craft aspect. Um, alternatively, for the more technical writer, um, practices such as free writing might provide a way of exploring outside your comfort zone. It will be different for everyone. <laughs> so you have to take away uh, what, what you need from this. So whereas techniques have more to do with the very structure of the poem, um, poetic devices in simple terms are tools for the poet to create rhythm and convey meaning, mood or feeling by the deliberate use of words, phrases, sounds, and even shapes. Certain poetic devices used in other poetry are less prominent in haiku, and often for good reason, as they perhaps take up too much attention or even minimize the impact of a haiku. Um, I'm thinking about devices such as metaphor, simile, personification, etc. However, if applied with subtlety and originality, can still be worth experimenting with, if it suits the poet's voice. So what is meant by voice in writing in general and in haiku in particular? <laughs> Let's come back to Oxford. And uh, Oxford Dictionary tells us that we are talking about the distinctive tone or style of a literary work or author. Tone then is conveyed for choice and use of words and phrases, viewpoint, syntax, etc. It is the way we express ourselves in writing. With some poems I know straight away who wrote it because their voice is infusing the work. 
Um, of course, since this is haiku, this is often subtly done and could be noticeable either in the internal aspects of the poem, externally, or both. But returning to that previous paragraph, how do we know what suits us? Well, this is how wide and close reading, and by close, I mean reading with deep attention and sensitivity, curiosity and patience, um, <clears throat> um, to, sorry, I lost myself there. It can be helpful in writing outside our comfort zone. And why? Um, because we may learn something new and we might incorporate this um, into our writing and uh, expand our perspective. Um, it could be as simple as seeing something in a new light. But Heike have many so-called rules. <laughs> we can't and definitely should not follow them all. But perhaps we need to be aware of them as the old um, cliche goes to be able to break or at least bend them. And this I feel is part of finding freedom in form. And what I mean by this is to express ourselves in our own unique way, speaking our own truths. Um, and I mentioned it before, but I feel this demands honesty, but also playfulness, hard work and an open mind amongst other things. It will shine through in every detail of our haiku both internally and externally, in the presentation, structure, line breaks, word choice, use of punctuation, aesthetics, subject matter, themes, etc., and may incorporate elements such as repetition, illusion, alliteration, use of abstraction, concrete elements, a pivot line, multiple cuts, symbolism, surreal, mythical, or other undertones, etc. The list is endless or at least unique to each writer and often this list of traits if you will that make up a voice is internalized and both develop and shift over time. Part of this process that may indeed be ongoing is about finding balance between intuition and craft um, and my advice is that we give it space to grow and let it subtly infuse our work. Sorry to interrupt you, Caroline, just for a sec. Yeah. Um, I think there's been a few messages about your uh, volume being a bit uh, soft. So if you wouldn't mind maybe oh. speaking a bit closer to the mic. Okay, I'm nice. going to move closer. And um, I have a soft voice, unfortunately. So um, can you hear me better now? I can hear you just fine. You can hear me. So I, I, I will try and speak up. So, Thank you um, so much. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. It's good to hear someone else's voice in the middle of it, actually. <laughs> it gets a bit lonely on Zoom. Um, so a few examples here to show how this can be incorporated um, in Haiku. The first one is by P.H. Fisher and was uh, published in Hedgerow. 433, All the Wild Snow. Allusion is used effectively to expand the poem in its exploration of silence or absence and what may be part of this and which we <laughs> obviously find out is snow. Um, I feel the one line structure unifies the poem, the word economy further enhancing the flow. The next poem is by Michelle Ruth Bernstein, published in Blight Spirits. What might have been the crow circles back. Effectively blending abstract and concrete imagery, the one line structure further the invitation of multiple meanings, readings, depending on where we place the cut or cuts. While the crow at least hints, I feel, at illusion. Um, the next poem is by Philip Rowland, taken from the new haiku, edited by uh, Barlow and Lucas. Inside an envelope, inside an envelope, funeral money. Repetition is used for impact in this poem that also takes use of punctuation to enhance the poem's matter-of-fact tone and surprise in the last line, while the symmetry, um, the symmetry created by the centered format adds an almost clinical feel. Um, experimenting with technique and poetic devices, etc., is not the only way to inject freshness and innovation to our work. Another way is through what we choose to write about and how we go about writing about it, i.e. through subject matter. 
And um, I will apologize for any of my, um, if I mispronounce it, any names here, but um, I am trying my best. I will use the example of Sugita Hisayun, a Japanese haiku poet who lived between 1890 and 1946, considered by many as one of the first important women in haiku with a modern sensibility. It has been argued that her work altered the domain of haiku. So let's look at just how. I will quote from a study, and you can see the name of the study below, um, on Hisayo by Susan Alice Stanford, um, also known as Alice the Wanderer, whose book are translations of Hisayo Lips Licked Clean, was published last year by Red Moon Press. Um, so quoting, Hisayo was for much of her career highly praised by Takahama Kiyoshi, the gatekeeper in her chosen domain. Being a woman, she was also marginalized, both as a member of society and as a writer. It was this paradoxical status which imposed specific challenges upon her while giving her access to a new perspective on haiku. So while Hitsayu's work remained traditionalist, um, the novelty of both her treatment and her thematic material made her work distinctive and exciting, according to Stanford. So hence a mandatory kigo and the chasse composition approach helped her find rather than prevented her from finding new vivid ways of writing. Her haiku were influenced by daily life, including domestic chores and bringing up children, um, as the below haiku shows, gums itching, the baby bites my nipple, spring's hazy sky. Um, this translation is from Makoto Ueda's Far Beyond the Field. Um, and later as her children were older and she could immerse herself more deeply in a variety of literature and could travel to places of historical significance, um, this influenced her haiku. And during the second period, um, Kiyoshi had imposed new restrictions, and I'm quoting from Stanford again, um, on the acceptable content of haiku. However, a continuity with the past was also stressed. And Hisayo avoided this push towards trivial content by the strategic use of illusion. And under the pressure, her style became highly compressed and multilayered with meanings that could be interpreted as, femini as feminist, but perhaps only by those open to it. Um, Stanford further emphasizes how um, Hisayo Hisoyo acutely felt the contradiction between her desire for time to write and the expectations placed upon women by the gender norms of the day. As the allusion to Nora from Henry Gibson's The Doll's House in the poem um, below shows, mending socks, I became not Nora, but a school teacher's wife. And this translation is um, by Hiroaki Sato in Japanese Women Poets and Anthology. Um, and two more examples, translated by Alice Wanderer in Lips Licked Clean. The blinds rolled up upon the persimmon flowers, a room of my own. Lips licked clean of red, the new year mirror. Well, there are so many plots to her life um, and subplots to her life, including propaganda such as the Hisayo legend, has since been corrected. Um, so I, I recommend further reading for context and interest. And if you're not familiar with her work, I recommend familiarizing yourself with her poems. Um, I'll finish this section um, with a personal favorite of mine, uh, which was written in the later stage of her life. Deep into the spring woods. Oh, sorry, I'm going, I'm going too fast. Chasing a butterfly. Deep into the spring woods, I am lost. And this translation is from Makoto Ueda's Far Beyond the Field. So um, we have seen here through this example how subject matter and writing about your life um, uh, can add um, freshness and innovation. It doesn't have to be about technique or devices, etc. cetera. Um, and I do really recommend um, those books and looking into that uh, study. And there's quite a few around. Um, very, very interesting reading. So, <clears throat> um, conveniently, having just had a look at examples of Japanese haikus translated into English, 
I would now like to shift the focus slightly and look closer at the aesthetic values underpinning, or at least informing in English language haiku. Um, these aesthetic values can be traced, of course, to the Japanese poetic tradition. But before we move on, let's explore what is meant by aesthetic values and how we can use them effectively and authentically in our work. An aesthetic value as a noun is a set of principles underlying the work of a particular artist or artistic movement. While most of us writing haiku in the English language are not fluent in Japanese, we can immerse ourselves in various art forms displaying the traditional Japanese aesthetics, as well as reading books and articles on the topic. This way we may over time absorb the meanings and develop an intuition of how they can be applied in our own work. These aesthetic principles are present in our own environment if we look for them, hence can be translated through our own words, feelings and senses. I'll use an example from a recent presentation uh, that I gave on how to read haiku. In Japanese, there is an aesthetic quality called ma. It's a simple yet complex concept to grasp, but for simplicity, let's translate it as space. The concept relates to all aspects of life, possible manifestations outside haiku it could be the silence between notes in music, the pause as we speak, or between verses in a bird song. In graphic design or photography, we may think of it as negative space, etc. It could be described as a pause or emptiness, absence or void between things. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is, I guess, <laughs> that when we look and think deeply about this quality, we will soon realize that it's not an exclusively Japanese quality, but can be found everywhere. This is important to remember in relation to haiku written outside Japan, i.e. we can borrow various concepts, aspects, aesthetic values, art forms, etc. Um, but when we do, they are translating using our own cultural and indeed personal context, which in turn highlights the importance of translation and authenticity of these by each poem um, and poet. Depending on our taste, <clears throat> depending on our taste, sorry for that, and purposes, we will be drawn to different aesthetic elements. Various aesthetics can help us achieve certain things like resonance, depth, feeling, a sense of mystery, lightness, echo, etc. There is overlapping between aesthetics, techniques and devices, complicating this process of evaluating our, our own work, but also inviting freedom and potential in this process of finding our own way. But how about aesthetics? Uh, how about other aesthetics? Could we borrow aesthetics? from other fields, or deepen our understanding of the aesthetics underpinning haiku by deepening our understanding about, say, art, photography, fiction. For instance, photography um, often informs my haiku, as already shown by the example earlier. Photography in simple terms is about light and recording the moment. And to me, so is often haiku. It can also be about conveying feeling and mood for images, which also relates to haiku. I also find that some non-haiku writers display haiku sensibility. And by haiku sensibility, I mean a sensitivity to the methods, techniques, approaches and aesthetics that underpin and inform haiku, which could relate to the images, use of space, immediacy, sensor engagement, etc. Um, examples include Virginia Woolf and, for instance, her to the lighthouse. Um, it's in the attention to the small details, for instance. Some sentences at times even read like haiku. And James Baldwin, and it was th thanks to Mike Relling, uh, when we chatted about the link between haiku and fiction, that he drew my attention to Baldwin. So thanks for that, Mike. Um, and in another country, for instance, there's something about the way the senses are they're guiding the narrative using concrete details and seasonality to great effect and letting us understand the characters through the immediacy of each moment unfolding. And more recently, I stumbled upon um, Breasts and Eggs by Mieko Kawakami, um, a brilliant book, which I found have the directness of an underpinning haiku utilizing images effectively, as well as space, simplicity, and other aesthetic values, 
and often focusing on small concrete details to evoke feeling. Um, so what these writers seem to have in common to me is that they trust the image. Um, in turn, this lends the writing a resonance similar to what we might find in Haiku. What about music? Miles Davis, for instance, is a musician that I feel we could learn from. The silence between notes, the feeling he manages to evoke. Um, I watched the documentary in which he created the soundtrack to film playing while watching spontaneously. Um, and it made me think a lot about the balance we seek in Heike between intuition and craft. Um, I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has any other examples of novelists or musicians or other artists um, that somehow infuse their art with hype like sensibility and how do they do it if you like and how has it inspired or helped you in your writing and um, so that would be very interesting if you could share some of that in the Q&A coming up soon. Um, so what I've tried to offer here um, are simply a few ways of approaching the process of evaluating your haiku by going back to the basics and looking at images, the relationship and the effective use of space, emphasizing that there are different techniques and poetic devices that can help us deepen our craft and evaluating skills. And also emphasizing the need to find balance between intuition and craft that is just right for you. And also underscoring how voice and vision can help in the process of assessing our work and write poems that are honest, authentic, and truly unique to us. Um, finally, I have a quick checklist that doesn't look too quick when you see it here. Um, but I just wanted to give something concrete because I know I've been um, talking a lot. Um, so what I've put on here is questions and followed by a few points where you could possibly explore further if you're interested. Um, so asking questions like, are the images used right for the poem? Are they effective, specific, clear, fresh, original? You might look at the senses, um, even synesthesia or abstraction. Um, is the distance between the images just right for the poem? Is there enough space for the reader? That's very important. What is the relationship between the images? Um, you might look at dissociation, comparison, friction, etc., and explore um, clarity versus ambiguity. Um, that might change according to um, poem, to, from poem to poem. Um, also, are we over relying on a certain technique, poetic device, theme, aesthetic, format, words? What is part of a voice? This is quite interesting to think about. We might not even be aware of it. It might have been internalized. Um, internal and external elements, um, the balance between intuition and craft. Um, you might ask yourself, does the poem convey feeling? Does it resonate? Where does it take the reader? What is the essence, if you will, of the poem? Um, are the deeper layers, multiple meanings? If not, how can we achieve this? Um, you might think about subject matter and accuracy, authenticity, authenticity and viewpoint. I'm getting tired now, sorry. And um, although I'm not on this list, I also advise, um, I advise reading your poems out loud because there, that way you can assess flow, sound, rhythm, etc. And I also, and I think this is crucial, I, I recommend close and wide reading, but I think that came through <laughs> through the presentation. Um, and, um, oops, that went too far. So I'd like to say thank you everyone so much for listening. Um, <laughs> um, I hope you got something out of it. And I, Really look forward to hearing you speak for a bit now because it's <laughs> it gets very lonely listening to your own voice for this long. And um, I would really like to know if you found some hike or some images in that first section about the senses. Um, and I would like to know if you have any aspects you felt should be in here that you use yourself, and if you have any non hiker writers or artists that you recommend. And my contact details are here. Feel free to email me about any questions about this.
or comments and I'm always happy to you know to discuss anything hiker related um that's about it um thank you very much I'm gonna put the video back on thanks so much Caroline that was brilliant and um I feel like you really took us on a bit of a journey of self-reflection and challenging us to dig deeper a little slow down a little and um I think there's a lot of messages echoing <laughs> echoing my um admiration for that as well um there's even a, a haiku dedicated to you by Jacob Salser that got buried in the chat if oh. you wouldn't mind me reading it <laughs> it's yeah, uh, that quite would delightful be that would um, be nice I'm gonna open the chat so I can have a look but I would really appreciate if you help me with this Antoinette because I feel quite <laughs> quite drained having sat and read for so long no absolutely um but yeah I just wanted to share Jacob's haiku okay <laughs> um, it's a light rain between waking and sleep Caroline's voice <laughs> <laughs> I have something similar with bird song but I really like that thank you so much Jacob <laughs> um yeah if anyone has questions please feel free to um, I, mute yourself. I, I have Can a question. Have yes, this is Peggy Belbro. I have a question. Uh, so in my writing, I'm beginning to feel very stale. Like I repeat the same themes, the same uh, feelings, the same emotions, the same uh, thing over and over again. I see them popping up again. So how do you go about what is your suggestion for breaking out of that comfort zone? How do you suggest breaking free from that staleness of your own comfort zone? Yeah, um, it's a very good question. And it's, it's, it sounds so simple, but obviously it isn't because we do have these comfort zones. And I don't think we have to venture too far out of them. But sometimes um, maybe it could come to reading books that you wouldn't usually read. Um, you might be trying out a few techniques that you don't usually try out. I don't know, do you, for instance, write at a certain time of day? You might try writing at a different time of day. Maybe write somewhere else. Go. I tend to write in at home in quiet, but sometimes sitting on the train amongst people and having the views passing, I can write there. So sometimes it's just changing little things and see where it takes you. Um, but definitely, I would say, number one, maybe read something that is completely out of your comfort zone. <laughs> something that you think, oh, I don't even like this. But you can still learn something. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question at all? Or? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. That's uh, as as everyone says, read, read, read. Well, yeah, it depends. Everyone learns in different ways. Um, it might be that you have you 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 create a writers group. It might be that you. It, it, I think it's really important to ask ourselves questions. What our intentions with writing are, what we want to achieve, and I don't mean that in an ambitious way. I mean for ourselves. It could be that you write to stay in the moment. It might <laughs> be writing for for sanity. I know, for instance, the. Um, the Japanese poet that I quoted, she has written essays on um, just writing poetry to, he feel, uh, to save your life, to stay alive, to kind of stay sane and stay focused and grounded. Or it could be for, for something else. So I think by asking questions and also exploring what other people do and how they do it, um, a combination of that. And then doing something different, try something different, you know, open your mind a little bit. That's what I would, <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I'm not saying I, I, I rely on things. I show it to my, um, my, my family and they say, mom, do you have to have dusk or, or a bird song in every hike? And I think, um, no, I don't. I don't. And how do I change it? <laughs> well, I have to go outside that comfort zone. A comfort zone is not necessarily bad. It can be your strength. But if we just venture outside it a tiny bit and take that with us back in, it can make those subtle, dramatic changes to our work. So, yeah, thanks for your question. Thank you. We have a hand up from Kate Jones. Go ahead, Kate. Um, oh, sorry. See, sorry, hold on. Okay. Um, Caroline, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, 
my question is about metaphor. You know, you sometimes, uh, I'm, I'm new to this, I've read sometimes, you know, haiku kind of stays away from metaphor because it's, I guess, with the idea that it's abstract. I personally find metaphor can lead you to your senses and can lead to meaning. So can you speak a little bit about what you see about metaphor in haiku? Yeah. Um, well, this is quite a big discussion. So <laughs> I don't know how, uh, if I can go too much into depth, I'm not prepared for it. But you should always say you can have a poem that can actually work on a literal level, but it can also double up as a metaphor. And then it adds, so it's an indirect metaphor. So that way it will add depth and, and meaning and multiple readings to a poem. But if it's just a metaphor in, in, in itself, it can somehow take away from what we call the actual the suchness of what is in the poem. But having said that, metaphor can definitely be used as a technique in haiku. If it's done delicately, and if you're doing it, if that's your voice and you are executing this <laughs> to perfection, you know, go for it. You know, that, that's what I would say. Thank you. They can come across a bit heavy handed uh, in, in haiku because we're working with understatement and subtlety on the whole. So I maybe look at how people are using, how are handling metaphor and indirect metaphor and see how, how you can find your way there, you know, the balance. Okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Caroline, there's been a question if you could just stop screen sharing so maybe you could. Okay, let's a little see. bit better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think anyway, so mm -hmm. um, stop here. There you That's go. It. Yeah. And there was also a question from Brad Bennett in the chat, uh, an intriguing one. Uh, one poetry teacher taught me that the poem knows more than you do. And Brad is wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. The poem knows more than you do. Yeah. Um, I think so. Um, I probably if anyone knows me know that I am not I I didn't start that as a technical writer at all it took me quite a while to understand the techniques um that's um, <laughs> maybe too much honesty uh, I tend to write uh, I tend to do free writing and rely on flow and I see what comes out and if it is haiku in there I will then sit down and look at it how we can fit in fit as a haiku and the more you write and the more you read I noticed I became more and more drawn to haiku so what came out was more and more haiku but I always feel that haiku is about haiku is about connections but haiku is also to me personally about discoveries and sometimes we can even discover new things in a poem that we write ourselves that we didn't know were there because we obviously have a lot going on and not everything is there for us to access all the time so I think actually on that point I think it's a really really good um exercise to sit down write as in free writing see what comes out don't use your we're always using our mind but try and switch off don't be your own critic while you're doing it and see what comes out and and leave it and, and go back into it and see because you will probably be surprised at what you are finding there and and I think that's how poems can teach us things. And also readers, because the reader obviously finishes a haiku, they will find things sometimes that we didn't even know were in there, which is very interesting. And I think that adds, um, that makes haiku so uh, fascinating. And you could never get bored with it because there's always more to explore and more to discover. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but it's a very, very intriguing question. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think we have space for one more question. If anyone. Well, I don't I don't have a hand thing. I couldn't raise my hand. But if you take a question. Yeah, for sure. Go for it. Or, or an observation. Um, I think one good thing is getting out and seeing a lot of different things, reading, dreaming. That's all good. But um, going to a place and. Uh, just to give you a small example, I did. Um, I went down to Arlington Cemetery during Memorial Day, and when I got down there, I started walking around, and and I realized how many stories were all over the place. You know, from the the grounds, the people, the uh, the horses. So there's just going out and just seeing a lot of things. I think is a great way. You know, that's the way everybody's done it. A lot of people have done it for that way um 
you know, the going back to the guy, the uh, boss show and those guys who just walked around Japan the whole time. I know nobody can do that anymore, but, <laughs> but I, I think it's a good idea just to get out there and really see the stories that are happening everywhere. I mean, I used to sit in my backyard and see tons of little stories, you know, nature and things like that. Not all great, certainly, but um, that's just my uh, point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think we'll let Roberta Berry have the last word. I see you have your hand up. Yep. Uh, Carolyn, as editor of Blythe Spirit, um, you're talking about haiku images or in between the haiku that says too much or is too ambiguous or um, what are your feelings about most of the submissions that you get from not, not, you know, even seasoned haiku writers as far as finding that sweet spot between those two places. I mean, my, my experience is that a lot of haiku that I, I read as an editor, well, and, you know, or judging different contests or whatever, there, there's a tendency to the obvious and that it's repeated in the first line. And then the, either the second or the third line is if everybody is not very intelligent. And, um, <laughs> you know, like we're going to miss the point or something, which I think is not, not at all as my, for my feeling about what haiku should evoke. It's okay. not, you know, like you might have missed the point, so I'm going to say it a different way mm -hmm. um, and yeah. maybe another way. Yeah, uh, Robert, I, I know. I, yeah, so, sorry, I just, I want to say before you come, because I want to say you said exactly, you definitely nailed it there, because what a lot of haiku poets do is that, or I would say they, um, us, I guess, is over-explaining it's like you say one thing and then you're just explaining what you had just said. So it's not two different images. It's just explaining the first image. And that is not interesting to read. And I think it takes a lot of reading Heike to realize what is interesting about it. I think there was a, um, an article in Modern Heike by, uh, by uh, the editor, with Paul, um, and he was saying this, there is this um, haiku that tends to just, it, and I guess it is metaphor you're explaining, but so you, no, it's a simile really, but you take away like, and you see a lot of that in haiku. So I agree. I think a lot of repetition and being too obvious um, that could serve us really well um, in haiku uh, as haiku writers. Uh, is that what you meant? It is, isn't it? Uh, it is. Um, well, that's one of the things that I, I, yeah. I think when, when you give that as a, you know, as part of your talk, um, I was hoping that people would hear that as leaning more towards the, the making the reader do some work part of it, mm -hmm. rather than the, you know, this is going to be obvious to everybody who reads it. I mean, but that's my personal preference. Not everybody has that. No. Um, well, as you know, with Blind Spirit, um, it's different than, for instance, Hedro. Hedro is, is about small poems. So they tend to have, tend to incorporate different styles and approaches a bit more. Whereas Blind Spirit is the high, British Hiker Society. And it's a more of a, how to say it, a nurturing going on because we are a society. So it's more about people learning and, you know, reading and learning some more. So I think I would probably accept slightly different poems for these journals, if that makes sense. At yeah, all. that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so I think what you're saying, and I do agree with you. I, I, do, I do, I do, I am fascinated by work that, tries to explore, go into the more ambiguous and the more, when I say clarity, that's what I try to say with the camera metaphor, that there are different ways of doing it. And by thinking about what we're trying to achieve, 
it, it's the same, and it's camera is so concrete. But in, in haiku, we often we just read uh, or we just write and we send it out. We don't think about it so much. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. And I wish sometimes that people just read it a few times and thought, why am I trying to do here? And is it working? That, that, and, that, and also your point about reading aloud, I, I'll just give this tip for people that might have um, Apple or iPads or iPhones. You can go under edit for most things that you write and press speech, highlight it and press speech. It will be a computer voice. Yeah, I often use that because it's better than my own reading of my own work. No, and I, I use it when I see other people's work too. If I'm, you know, looking at something as an editor or as a judge, because it does, it does really bring you up short sometimes to hear either how jarring your own work sounds or how musical or something in between. Absolutely, and when someone else reads it, we hear it in a different way. So it's actually a very good idea. That's a very good idea, Roberta. Thank you. You brought up some very, very good points. Okay, Thanks. well. Um, and thanks for listening. <laughs> thanks. It was a very great pre presentation. Thank you. I appreciate that. I also, I, I want to give, a, can I just apologize? I saw in the chat just quickly that you would have preferred to see my lips because I have a, um, a soft voice. I apologize. I didn't see that. I would have left myself on if that was a, a case. Um, I just didn't think about that. I, so I, sorry. Next time I will be. I will be here with my lips moving. <laughs> Thanks so much, Caroline. I think uh, I can I can say for myself and everyone that we enjoyed your presentation thoroughly, and the fact that we've gone way over <laughs> for the conversation means that you know you've brought a lot of um, things to discuss and think about. So the next session is in three minutes. <laughs> everyone, go for a bathroom break. Um, but that will be by Terry French, and I'm moderated by Michael. And really, so we'll see you back. But feel free to continue the chat here. Thank you, Antoinette, for this.